Good evening, everybody. In the bar, you know, in the bar, you know, welcome to the July edition of Nkata Umuibe. This event, as most of us here know, is organized by the Center for Memories in collaboration with the Enugu Sports Club. We're about to start, and I want to invite, on behalf of the chairman of the Enugu Sports Club, the media secretary, Sir Emmet Mbelo, to give us his welcome remarks. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I um, have to welcome especially those who are coming for this program for the first time. Uh, this is a program organized by Nkata, for Nkata Mubai, Center for Memories in Enugu. It is a, a program designed for us to chart a new course for Igbo Nation and Igbo people in general. And as we can see, we are beginning to make impact within so short a period. This program is more than a year old now, and we've tried as much as we can with collaboration with, uh, in collaboration with Enugu Sports Club and Urban Radio Enugu to make sure that every month we scout for a guest that we talk to our people to make our people realize where we are or where we are heading to. Ironically, the way things are moving to in Nigeria now, there's no other better time to think about the Ibo nation than now. So I thank the organizers of this program, particularly uh, Center for Memories for making the effort to bring our people, our people together. Thank you very much, and I hope you will enjoy the lecture. Thanks so much. You are welcome. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like you said, this event, we've had this since May last year. This is probably our 14th edition. And it's organized by the Center for Memories. But some people here may want to ask who or what is Center for Memories and what do they do, what do they represent, how did it all come about. We have one of the founders of the center here with us, Nkemweke, to come and tell us a bit about Center for Memories within a few minutes, then we'll talk about the event and start off. Welcome. Good morning. Good evening. My name is uh, Ken Weke. Um, I'm here to, I think, in our usual fashion, tell you some more about the Center for Memories. We basically started this idea about two years ago when um, myself, Patrick Okibo, uh, Nana, and three other people were having a you know, light discussion and we're asking ourselves how do we get our children or our young ones to understand our culture or to get to know more about our culture. And we said, you know, what better time than to start an initiative that can be able to communicate that to them. And the, for your lack of a better word, the best name we came about was Center for Memories. And in two years, we've actually grown. Um, we have a place at uh, Independence Layout. And we have exhibitions um, every quarter whereby we take different arts or artists who come to talk about what they are doing, and people come and visit as well. One of the initiatives that has come out from the Center for Memories is actually Nkatao Mibe. And I also want to thank you guys for being here. Um, we are actually soliciting for your support for us to get, you know, uh, mind share. We have calls from people around the world to say they like what we're doing and they want to get to know what we're doing. And, you know, we have volunteers who come to work with us. So it's important for us to all work together. Everybody can add something, you know, to this project to make it very big. So uh, please come and visit us. Talk to us probably after the program if you want to get to have or know more clarifications about what we're doing and how we plan, you know, to expand. Thank you very much. I'll call Nana now to uh, introduce our guest. The activities that the Center for Memory decided to embark on is this monthly discussion series in addition to the exhibitions and all the other events that we do and the reason behind that is that 
we found that it had become very important to begin to congregate and aggregate issues around the Igbo society, to redefine the Igbo narrative in a way that creates an intersection, a conversational intersection between the old and the young. And so we do it every month, like I said, and we've spanned through a number of topics. We started off with Igwe Kunye, we've had topics like Echi Dime, we've had topics like Ejin Duemegene, we've had topics like Onye Kwe Chi Ekwe, Ohangweze. And all of these topics cut through very, very substantial issues about the Igbo society. Family, values, identity, technology, the digital economy, enterprise. Oh, we've gone through quite a lot. And we still have a lot to come here to discuss. And each month, we identify a distinguished speaker who will take on a topic that is very relevant to the Igbo society, both of contemporary times and prehistoric times, because we need to connect our young people, especially our young people, on Ife Jemalu Igbo. When you say Nibu Nibu, what does that necessarily mean? And so this month, we found just the right man for the right topic. I'm tempted to say that he needs no introduction, but let me just remind us that he went to FGC Meduguri. So he is one of the very few Nigerians that is privileged to have gone to a unity school. I'm one of those. And it might interest you to know that we have an association of all of us that went to unity schools and our president is here, all the way from Lagos, Mr. Lawrence Wilbur, so just to recognize you. And other Yusufans came from here, Okara Igwe came all the way from Port Harcourt, because we support ourselves whenever we are out here. And so, Frank went to FGC Meduguri, thereafter he went to the University of Meduguri and graduated with a second class of a degree in theology. He then backed on his private endeavor and public service called him. He was appointed chief of staff to the Enugu state governor. Thereafter, Nigeria found him. And he was then appointed the minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. He went through three ministries, intergovernmental affairs, youth development, and special duties, information and national orientation, and information and communication. To underscore the nature of the man, Frank, the private sector also sought him out and appointed him the Director General of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group, which is the private sector, Nigeria's premier private sector think tank. And so you find that there are very few Nigerians that have had very good experiences in the public service and in the private sector in the way he has done. He is a graduate of the prestigious Harvard Kennedy School. He's a medicine fellow. And he's here to speak to us on a topic. Maka Oganiru. Igbo Renaissance and the leadership question. Ladies and gentlemen, please, with a round of applause, let's invite Frank Mweke Nkato. Good evening. None. I cannot say how much that I feel privileged to be here today as the speaker for this month. <laughs> anyway, just before today, we had, I had a running battle with Nana and uh, Patrick Okibo. Uh, when they approached me about two weeks ago to say that um, they felt I should be doing this today, and I resisted very, very strongly because I didn't think it was a good idea. But I honestly feel 
honored to be here. And I want to thank the leadership of Nkatu Mwibe and, of course, the Center for Memories, the joint organizers of the monthly dialogue series for inviting me to lead the conversation for July. I'm flattered. And when I say that, I want you to take me seriously. I'm sounding like Trump. You know, each time he speaks, he says, believe me, believe me, believe me. <laughs> but I'm really flattered to be inducted into this league of very distinguished sons and daughters of Igbo land who have had the privilege of standing here to share their views on a range of issues, some general in nature, and others more specific to certain development aspirations of Edimbo in particular. The topic that I've been given to speak on, upon today, Makoganiru, the Igbo Renaissance, and the leadership question, to my mind, is a subject that is general in nature. And there are, or you're going to find, as many perspectives on this issue as there are, um, uh, you know, as uh, the number of persons whose views you may seek on the matter. But broken down, this topic, to my mind, speaks to a crisis of leadership in Igbo land and the need for a renaissance in order for meaningful progress to take place. Let me say up front, however, that most of what I'm going to say today is not peculiar to most, uh, is, is not peculiar to Igbo land. I believe it is going to apply to most parts of Igbo land, uh, most parts of Nigeria, perhaps in varying degrees, because there is no denying the fact that there, is, there are crises of every nature in every part of our country today. No region has been spared the insecurity, the economic hardship, and the pervasive sense of foreboding and help hopelessness amongst our populace. The business sector has not been spared, and no meaningful, and no meaningful business and economic growth can take place in an atmosphere of insecurity. Without prejudice to the foregoing, however, I'd like to provide the following brief context based on my personal knowledge and understanding of the Igbo leadership question. The Igbo leadership question is characterized by a multiplicity of individuals, elected and unelected, who stake claim to Igbo leadership. The cacophony of voices that claim to speak for the Igbo and the absence of consensus on issues of regional interest. At no time is this more pronounced as it is during election cycles, when there are contending political and pecuniary interests. The consequence of all of this is that the Igbo rarely coalesce around a common agenda, thereby weakening its negotiating position. Contending political groups take advantage of the region's political fragmentation, with personal interest subsume regional interests, and the progress of the entire region is sacrificed. The region is then completely sidelined and treated like a pariah. Its people denied representative appointments and employment into sensitive national governance structure. It is left out of infrastructure development plans, while existing projects get little or no budgetary allocations, and has no limited and consequently has no voice in the management of national affairs. We're all familiar with this situation, I believe, but how did we get here? How call people are the managers of our public affairs who have perfected the politics of what I call mutually assured destruction? Perhaps we remember the sudden romance between the members of the PDP and the APC a few months to the last elections. The equal political elite has perfected the art of extreme republicanism, seemingly unable to reach consensus on issues of common interest with a national reputation for political mercantilism at the expense of group interest. And one of the most appalling manifestations, to my mind, of the crisis of leadership in Igbo land and disunity amongst its people is the cynicism and disrespect with which Ohaneze, the foremost sociocultural group in Igbo land, 
and its representatives are regarded. I'm unaware of any other sociocultural group that constantly face the kind of challenge that Chief Indian Wodo and his colleagues contend with daily, internally, and externally. I'm not unaware of the often repeated dictum, Naibwenweze, an attribute of our Republican nature, but which to my mind has assumed extreme and fatalistic dimensions given the heterogeneous nature of Nigeria and the contest for political power and resources. There's no way that a house that is divided against itself can stand. It is my firm belief, therefore, that there is a nexus between the place and experience of the Igbo in Nigeria today and the internal conflicts in our cultural, political, and economic socialization within Igbo land. I'm going to take the next few minutes to provide some perspective on leadership, given that it is essentially the fulcrum of our discourse today, and especially for the benefit of the younger members of our audience. Individuals in the front line, or at the zenith of institutions, are often referred to as leaders. And people who address them as such may be right, depending on the context within which the so-called leaders are addressed, as I will shortly clarify. I would like to state categorically that leadership is not a position. In other words, are contrary to widely held beliefs, occupying a position at any level does not, at least it should not, make you a leader. At best, such a position may confer on you some authority to act and exercise certain powers, but it certainly does not make you a leader. The distinction must therefore be made that being in a position of authority and a position of leadership are two different things. However, a position of authority provides opportunity for you to exercise leadership. Any action, to my mind, by anyone in a position of authority, no matter the level, which does not bring some verifiable improvement in the human condition, to my mind, is not an act of leadership. At least it should not be regarded as one. Such an individual or individuals should neither be described or addressed as leaders. It therefore follows that anyone can be a leader by simply doing what a leader should do. It doesn't matter your station in life. It doesn't matter where you are or what you do, insofar as your action brings succor, improvement, and progress, albeit momentary, you are a leader in that moment in time. In other words, leadership is not static. It is dynamic. Therefore, if anyone aspires to be called a leader and to be addressed as one on an ongoing basis, such an individual must embrace a critical consciousness that enables him or her to commit their entire life to the service of the people at whatever level they may find themselves. Leadership and the exercise of it is not restricted to any profession. As so musicians, mechanics, teachers, soldiers, policemen, comedians, bankers, civil servants, farmers, drivers, artisans, and a host of others. Not mentioned all, all here, all have opportunities to exercise leadership in the course of their duties and their daily life. This is consistent with the classical definition of leadership, which infers that a leader is someone who is able to direct, guide, and inspire a followership to a certain direction or consistent set of actions and or ends. Let me put on record that it is ignorant and self-deprecating when we recognize and appear to celebrate only the more prominent roles in public and private sectors as positions of leadership or authority and fail to recognize that we're all leaders in our own right, as mothers, as fathers, uncles, brothers, sisters, class monitors, gate men, cooks, cleaners, traffic wardens, including the abuelo in the motorbike. If you don't agree, just stop for a moment and contemplate what would happen, especially on a rainy night, for instance, if you arrived at your gate and your gate man was not there to open the gate for you. Upon a little reflection, perhaps you will see how these individuals improve your life's condition on an ongoing basis by simply helping you deal with mundane tasks. Mundane they are, but also very important. Martin Luther King, for instance, was not a bishop. He didn't hold any national office. He was simply a minister 
at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Alabama. And yet, you couldn't tell the story of America and the fight for rights for blacks without talking about Martin Luther King. Mahatma Gandhi was not a national office holder, and yet he became a leader of millions by his clear determination to challenge and oppose British rule and to promote India's self-rule. A designation should therefore not define you, rather let your actions define you and your ability or otherwise as a leader, especially when you hold authority on behalf of the people at whatever level. Just as I was putting this together, I found a very comical, very comical perspective on leadership by James McGregor, author of the book titled Leadership, and I quote, Many acts heralded or bemoaned as instances of leadership, acts of oratory, manipulation, sheer self-advancement, brute coercion, are not such. Much of what commonly passes as leadership, conspicuous position taken without followers, or follow through, posturing on various political stages, manipulation without general purpose, or territorialism is no more leadership than the behavior of small boys marching in front of a parade who continue to strut along Main Street after the procession are turned towards the fairground. End of quote. I found that very funny. Now, let's look at the state of affairs today and to try to see if there's a linkage between the present sorry state of our country the entire country, and the quality of leadership. So in the light of the above submissions on leadership, can we identify a nexus between our country's poor human development indices, dilapidated in state of national and subnational infrastructure, insecurity, secessionist agitations, corruption, unemployment, illiteracy, and poor educational and health outcomes, low industrialization, increased emigration, and failure of leadership, and incapacity on the part of those in authority. And I find some very important examples across Africa as well. The position of Rwanda after the genocide of 1994 comes to mind. The country has no obvious natural resources, no access to the sea, a very small population, just about 12 million today. Hilly and inconvenient for agriculture or most other forms of large-scale economic activity, yet the emergence of President Paul Kagame has made all the difference. It's been a turning point. And by the clear vision, mobilization of the people, organization of the country, and effective actions consistent with its stated objectives, Rwanda now has one of the fastest growing economies in Africa and is now held up as an example of effective leadership, resulting in a marked improvement of the circumstances of a whole nation. And while we laud, uh, while we laud the results that are self-evident, we should consider the budget of Rwanda in 2012, for instance. At that time, the budget of Rwanda for the entire year was $220 million. Compared to the total budget of five, east, five southeastern states during the same period, which approximated to about $382 million. Now, look at the population of Rwanda, roughly 10.5 million as at that time, and then compare with the approximate population of the southeast of Nigeria. And yet, when you look at the outcomes from the national budget of Rwanda during that period, you cannot, in good conscience, say that the Southeast, the outcomes from the Southeast uh, 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 you know, provides any uh, um, significant uh, comparison. Now, earlier, I spoke about the pervasive lamentations about the exclusion of Igbo in the management of the nation's affairs. And since Nkatu Mibe encourages informed debate, I have taken liberty to obtain some information about Igbo representation at the federal level from 1999 to the present time, to enable us reason together. Let us take a look at Southeastern representation in the armed forces. The paramilitary forces, including the Immigration and Intelligence Services, the Senate, House of Representatives, since Nigeria's return to democracy. The armed forces. Between 2006 to 2008, Chief Marshal Paul D.K. was Chief of as staff under President Obasanjo and briefly under President Yaradwa. Between 2008 and 2010, Air Chief Marshal Paul Dike was the Chief of Defense Staff under Yaradwa. And between 2010 and 2014, Lieutenant General 
Azubike Hejirika was Chief of Army Staff under President Jonathan. Under the paramilitary services, between 2000 and uh, the year 2000 and 2004, Lady Yusi Mwizu was Controller General of Immigration under Obasanjo. And between 2005 to 2010, Mr. Shukura Joseph Ude was Controller General of Immigration, also under President Obasanjo. From, two, from 2010 to 2013, Rose Chinyere Uzoma was Controller General of Immigration, now under Jonathan. For the police, Obonia Onobo was Inspector General of Police, under Yaradua. And in 2009, Bernard Wadialo was Controller General of Customs, just a few months because of his retirement age. For the intelligence services, Ambassador Ucho Okeke was Director General of the Nigeria Intelligence Agency between 1999 to 2007. I go to the National Assembly. The Southeast has occupied the President of Senate position for eight out of 19 years since the current republic and has occupied the Deputy Senate President position for a total of 12 out of 19 years since the current, uh, the current republic, making the Southeast the longest serving of all the ethnic groups in either of these positions so far. For the benefit of the younger people, I know that history is no longer being taught in schools. It's been banned for decades now. But in 1999, for most parts of 1999, Evan Enwerem was president of Senate. Between 1999 and 2000, uh, Dr. Chuba Okadibo was president of Senate. From 2000 to 2003, Chief Payo Saim was president. Then from 2000 to 2005, it was Adolphus Mwabara. And then from 2005 to 2007, it was Chief Ken Namani. And from 2007 to 20, um, so for the presidents of Senate. For the position of Deputy President of Senate, we had um, Chief Ike Kweremadu from 2007 to tw 2019, 12 years. And currently, we have Chief Ojuz Okalo, 2019, just in the last couple of days, announced as the Chief Whip of the Senate. Let us look at the House of Representatives. Now, the Southeast has never occupied the position of the Federal House of, uh, of Speaker but it has occupied the deputy speaker position for four years while it has occupied the deputy leader position exclusively since 1999. Exclusively since 1999. So deputy speaker, 2011 to 2015, Emeki Hedioha. Deputy um, um, leader of the Federal House. You had 1999 to 2003, you had Arukwe. Uh, 2003 to 2007, you had Gilbert Naji. Then 2015 to 2019, he had uh, Chukuma Oyema, but he was deputy minority leader. And then from uh, 2019 to date, I don't, I'm not aware that anyone has been, uh, there's anybody from the, this, from the Southeast. But for chief whip of the Federal House, between 2007 and 2011, we had Emeki Hadeoha. He was chief whip of the House of Representatives. Now, ladies and gentlemen, having heard what I've just said, I'm curious to know if and how your views may have changed with regard to the claim or uh, perception of marginalization and exclusion from mainstream governance. This information, as you can see, relates to representation in the armed and paramilitary services and the legislature. With respect to the judiciary, it is important to point out that the Honorable Justice Rosalind Ukeje was Chief Judge of the Federal High Court. She was the first female and one of the longest serving in recent memory from 2001 to 2008. The Igbo have not had representation either as president or vice president since the advent of the current democracy. But, and I was yet to obtain data on executive appointments in parastatals and boards by presidents from 1999 to 2019 as at the time of this event, and therefore understand that the information I provide may not paint the whole story. But in the light of what is available, can the Igbo, can we continue to claim exclusion in mainstream governance, taking cognizance that leadership emerges in the National Assembly, for instance, through majority political parties? And where the political party has spread as the PDP had in the period 1999 to 2007, it is easier to achieve representation, even with executive appointments. 
Let me, however, introduce a different dimension, which is really the main reason I actually sought this data. And it is the issue of the constitutional provision for the appointment of individual ministers from each state of the Federation. And it may be useful to examine the portfolios assigned to Southeast ministers during the past 20 years. So we've had the privilege of ministerial positions of transport, foreign affairs, Chief Ojo Madwekwe, Chief Dibemo Anya, foreign affairs, uh, Ngozo Konjiwola, Minister of Finance, Minister of Foreign Affairs, then Minister of Finance for about seven years, obvious as a question in education, Shukwe Meka Chikelu, um, Ambassador Thomas Agui Ronsi Defense, Charles Ugu Commerce and Industry, I'm going to spare you, but then we've been, we've had an Igbo as Central Bank Governor, but taken holistically, there are three perspectives to the sets of information provided above. It is clear from the distribution of the appointments already in the military, especially in the military, that presence of Basanjo, Yaradua, and Jonathan, and the PDP demonstrated statesmanship and greater sensitivity to Nigeria's diversity by ensuring representation of Nigeria's various groups in the nation's governance structure. This should always be a consideration in order to give the nation's component groups a sense of inclusion and belonging. The other dimension is the quality of representation that we have had from representatives in these positions. And I invite you to take particular note that over an eight-year period from 1999 to 2007, Igbo had the position of Senate President exclusively. And this was the third highest ranking position in the country. Umunem, I urge you to let's keep emotions aside. And I'd like to ask, what legacies can we point to as the outcomes of these years of representation at those levels? Take another look at the ministerial portfolios. By all standards, some of these were prestigious and pivotal. And I ask, how did we deploy these representative opportunities? And so we had the yam, we had the knife. How much? What quantity did we cut for ourselves? And so, like Chino Achebe said in the very first lines of his book, The Trouble with Nigeria, wherein he said, the problem with Nigeria is simply, is purely and squarely a failure of leadership. He said, there's nothing basically wrong with the Nigerian character. There's nothing wrong with the climate or the air in Nigeria. It is simply a failure, the inability of his leadership to rise up to the challenge of leadership and uh, to take responsibility of and provide a, a, a personal example. But I'm being mindful of the intense competition for resources and the geoethnic sensitivities in Nigeria. Does the region have the moral authority to lament, neglect, and modernization if its own representatives have been unable to meet its expectations? In any case, how have we fared in each of the states of the Southeast in which there is homogeneity of culture, of language, norms where our own people, our own governments have total control of its resources. How have we governed ourselves and what is the poverty situation here? What is the state of our infrastructure? What are the states, what is the state of our roads, our schools, our hospitals? How much planning goes on in these states? Before going notwithstanding, let me without equivocation that the policy of exclusion of regions from strategic appointments for not voting for candidates of a particular party is dangerous. It is divisive. It is unstatesmanly. It is impolitic. It is undesirable. It is unhealthy. And it is unhealthy for national cohesion and unity. Now, as I reflected on my presentation today, I recalled what may be a historical parallel to the current experience of the Igbo, and I seek your indulgence to share a brief history with you. Now, in 1999, there were two front runners as candidates. One was President Obasanjo of the People's Democratic Party, and the other person was Chief Olu Falai. Both of them were Yorubas. Though President Obasanjo won the elections, but the PDP lost each and every state in the Southwest. The PDP lost each and every state in the Southwest. And those states, six of them, 
were won by the Alliance for Democracy. And that was the situation until 2007, when the PDP won all but Lagos in the elections. You may also recall that between 1999 and 2007, in fact, to 2007, the Alliance for Democracy and the Action Congress, they had a running battle with the federal government of Nigeria. They had a major, major running battle. They were left excluded from the budgeting. They were excluded from the planning. In fact, the funds of local governments were seized. For one thing or the other, they were seized. They were withheld for several years. And though the region's mainstream political elite remained in opposition during 1999 to 2015 when the PDP was in power at the center, they got more than their fair share. A strategy which the PDP had hoped would help them to really garner support. But what is the lesson here? The lesson for me is the principal tenacity of the Yoruba political class, their steadfast opposition to the ruling PDP, and the equanimity with which they bore their plight. But most importantly, their historic comeback in 2015 through the instrument of a strategic alliance with Northern Nigeria, positioning the region as a preferred political partner to the exclusion of the Southeast from mainstream governance at the federal level since 2015. It is clear from the foregoing that the fringe position of the Yorubas from 1999 to 2015 was based on choice, on choice. And they took, they took responsibility for these choices during the same period, the Igbo also made their own choices, and the consistency of these choices appeared to suggest to my mind that it may be anchored on some deeply held egalitarian political principles. But as we can see, while one group had taken full responsibility for their own choices, in accordance with Newtonian principles, the other appeared to want to eat their cake and have it. My personal position is that the Igbo must take full responsibility for the political choices that we have made. I had Asosa. It is not in the culture of the Igbo man to salivate because of the aroma emanating from across the fence on food that is being cooked by your neighbor. It's not in our culture. It's totally alien to our culture. So what are the lessons? The additional lessons that the Igbo political class can learn from the Yoruba experience are cohesion, unity, and clarity of vision, patience, dignity, tenacity, mobilization, accommodation, but most importantly, contentment. That when you have made your choice, you must be content with that choice, whilst you continue to prepare for a comeback. They were in the political trenches for 16 years or so to speak, but they persevered, coming together when they needed to and disagreeing when they had to for the ultimate and overall benefit of their region. I cannot fail to point out the influence of Yoruba patriarchal system on the politics of the region and how they are able to deploy the expertise of their intelligentsia, the influence of their sociocultural groups made up of their elders who enjoy the recognition and consultative patronage of the political elite. Now, I'm going to talk to you next on what I consider to be the road to Igbo Renaissance. The way in which the Yorubas walk their way to political reckoning is not novel as I would show in the later part of my presentation. But it suffices to say that it holds significant lessons for Igbo elites, the region's intelligentsia, and important sociocultural groups, which had played major roles in Igbo thought leadership and ascendancy in the past. So rather than bemoan under the weight of despondency that is pervasive in the Southeast today, the region must see its current political dilemma as a great opportunity for introspection and mobilization for the resurgence of Igbo thought leadership that will frame the challenges before us within Buhari's Nigeria and convert strategic engagement options for survival under the prevailing circumstances. Igbo Renaissance will require a pan-Igbo effort involving the participation of all segments of our population. Political office does not necessarily confer wisdom, and I hold a strong view that co-opting the region's intelligentsia and sociocultural groups, including faith institutions, to generate ideas as well as act as sounding boards for public policy options will have positive outcomes. What the Yoruba elite was able to demonstrate is that leadership is not always necessary to be exercised at an individual level. The key to Yoruba success has been the triumph of collective leadership, whereby individual members of the elites were able to, or motivated by their visions of enlightened collective self-interest, 
to subsume personal ambition or temptations for instant gratification for a much bigger price for their region if patience and wisdom could be brought to their predicament. It is probably common knowledge to some of you that in addition to all of these things, even whilst they were in the trenches, the Yoruba elite proceeded to actually formalize a development uh, uh, um, uh, structure called uh, the Development Agency Agenda for Western Nigeria, the Dawn Commission, where they actually came together and have built consensus on the development aspirations and the strategies for really taking the Southwest uh, forward. If we must achieve this Igbo Renaissance, it will be critical that we leverage our history as builders and as innovators. So I'd like to proceed by saying that there can be an Igbo Renaissance. In order for this to happen, however, we must embark on a journey of cultural rediscovery and leverage our history as builders and innovators. We must return to first principles to interrogate and rediscover our identity. Who are we? What are we known for? What factors have converged to erode our identity and cultural values in the way that they have been, become eroded today? How and why have we from, come from the positions of leadership and preeminence in academia, in science, in medicine, in history, politics, that our forebears earned by merit to the positions of underdogs, despised, humiliated, we're literally begging for our lives, literally. We seem apologetic about everything. But ladies and gentlemen, Igbos are courageous people. Igbos are warriors. Igbos are resilient people. Above all, the Igbo are a people steep in their veneration of justice. We believe that actions have consequences and that leadership imposes on the leader the obligation to rule, guide, and influence the people justly, courageously, and with visible results in improvement of the well-being of, of our society. Our history is replete with acts of heroism by our forebears as they fought for their dignity at various times. And those familiar with, en with Enugu will know that the sculptured work of men breaking free from chains mounted at the Rangers Avenue roundabout on route Government House Enugu is a memorial of sorts for coal miners massacred by colonialists at Iva Valley uh, coal mines in 1949 while protesting poor working conditions. You may have read about the Abba Women Rebellion in 1929 over introduction of taxes for women, but you may not have heard about the scope and impact of that resistance across the length and breadth of the then eastern region, which covered the current southeast and south-south geopolitical zones. I urge you all to take more interest in history, especially Igbo history. I, really, I find it really fascinating. There are also copious historical accounts of the heroic acts undertaken by Igbo slaves to die in dignity, such as the 1773 mass suicide aboard a slave ship, New Britannia. You may already know about the exploits of Oluado Equino, an Igbo slave who became the first slave to buy his freedom. He subsequently campaigned for the abolition of slavery. Kalu Waoma, social mobility from slave to slaver, Warren Chief, Prebeterian uh, Elder, and British Knight between 1865 and 1940 is also worthy of note. Igbos are innovators and builders, and our fathers before us, their heirs and successors, continue to record many firsts in multiple fields of endeavor. And I'm happy to share with you the history of people like Kenneth Dike, the first black vice chancellor of the University of Ibadan, people like Professor Chikobi, the first Nigerian professor of mathematics, people like Professor Frank Ndili, PhD in nuclear physics and chemistry, Dr. Philip Emagwali, computer scientist. Dr. Pius Okibo, first Nigerian PhD in economics. Professor Chino Achebe, author of Things Fall Apart. Cyprian Ekwensi, Chimamanda Adichie. Ada Priscilla and Zimiro, the first female Igbo doctor in 1950. Simon Onwu, the second Igbo medical doctor. Ben Onwu, foremost artist. And the first, first black person to have the Queen of England sit for him to sculpture, for him to sculpt. I can go on and on. There are so many of them. Professor Francesca Okeke, University of Nigeria, scientific study, 
on climate change. Damon Anya on radio transmitters from Harbour Granules and local materials. Philip Animalu, uh, uh, Animalu, PhD physics, theory of high temperature superconductivity. Professor Bart Naji, professor of robotics. Uh, Dr. Chimaru Kinaman, Peter Sojourn. These are Igbo sons and daughters. This list is not exhaustive. We've not even scratched the surface. But the point I'm trying to make is that our people have the intellect. Our people have the exposure. Our people have the capacity. And this is not a capacity that was earned today. This is a capacity that is almost in our DNA. It's been there, it's been demonstrated in the course of our history. Now, having said all of this, I want to ask the question, do Igbo really need government? So I've listed for you everything that has happened from 1999 to, 2000, uh, to 2019. The positions that we've held. And I'm asking, what's the legacy of those positions? I leave you to answer that. And so, but it makes me answer, do Igbo really need government? So in the early part of my presentation tonight, I draw attention to the presentation that Igbo have had in government in the last 20 years since Nigeria's return to democracy. I've similarly shared with you, I'm, I'm going to share with you very briefly an abridged account of the Obara years, Michael Obara years, in 1959 to 1966. I must confess that even as I realize that the two periods constitute two different political historical epochs, I'm unable to resist the temptation to compare both periods, especially in terms of the benefits that accrue to the region from government, the former being regional and the latter subnational, the states, and national, federal. Now, the stark contrast in achievement and impact of government on the Igbo nation during the two periods underscores the importance of quality leadership at every level of public governance in a society. And from the accounts of the Obara years, it was discernible that a deliberate and conscious effort was made to plan, to consult, to engage, execute, review, and account for government actions and resources. The Igbo Renaissance will therefore be sustained through the agency of visionary and disciplined political leadership across the current five states of the five southeast states. Now, political leadership is critical. But the primacy of the private sector is even more so, especially in a market-driven economy like Nigeria's, for an Igbo renaissance to be realized and sustained. And my position is rooted in the acephalous nature of Igbo, of Igbo society, and its amenability to only subtle political control. The Igbo take their destinies in their hands rather than wait for help from other quarters. Unafraid to chart new courses, the Igbo are adventurous and explore new territories. Widely traveled, yeah, and the Igbo are probably the most widely traveled of Nigeria's ethnic groups, willing to go anywhere just to make a living. It is therefore no wonder that Igbo investment across the country is reported to be higher than the GDP of the Nigerian economy. The size of Nigeria's GDP is about $500 billion. And Igbo investments across the states of Nigeria was reported to be in excess of 900 trillion naira. That's in excess of $2 trillion. A study by the International Journal of Science and Technology Research highlighted the attributes of the Igbo as communal, as capitalist, republican, individualistic, with strong attachment to family. The same study suggested or reported that Igbos own 74% of the investments in Lagos. This, to my mind, shows clearly that the salvation for Igbos will not come from government, but from its people, especially its entrepreneurial class. I would like to point out that given the increasingly volatile political environment in Nigeria and the penchant to attack Igbo and their businesses, Igbo business leaders must, must articulate or adopt a risk mitigation strategy to protect their business interests scattered all over Nigeria. I don't know how many of you have seen the threats issued yesterday by a northern group giving governors who were opposed to the Ruga settlement policy of government, 30 days to change their minds. Otherwise, they will send back every southerner in other parts of the country. 
I have highlighted some of our history very briefly. But nothing underscores the glorious past and the latent capacity of the Igbo as builders and innovators as much as the quality of leadership that catalyzed the transformative economic growth which made the economy of the then Eastern region the fastest growing economy in the world, according to a study by the Michigan State University at the time. And again, for the benefit of the young members of this audience in particular, I want to ask the question, who was Michael Okbara? And Michael Okbara was Premier of the Eastern Region. He was born in 1920 and passed on in 1984. He was Premier of the Eastern Region from 1959 to 1966 under the party called the NCNC, the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons. Based on recent historical accounts, Dr. Michael Okbara remains one of the most outstanding Igbo leaders of the 20th century. And in a lecture delivered in Abuja on February 26, 2014, excerpts of which I have taken verbatim below, Professor Anya Oanya described the period of Okbara's stewardship of Eastern Nigeria as the golden age in Nigeria's uh, development. According to him, by 1964, five years after Okbara's ascendancy to the premiership, Eastern Nigeria was rec as recorded by the research group in uh, Michigan State University in the USA, it was the fastest growing and industrializing economy in the world, ahead of Malaysia, Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. How did this happen? It was the combination of Opera's unique vision, in which agriculture and industrial development were the twin pillars on which he built the Eastern Nigerian economy. In agriculture, his plans had a twofold thrust the development of the farm settlements and the anchor for food crops, such as rice and poultry development, as well as the establishment of estates of palm oil, cocoa, cashew, which were processed for export. Alongside the agricultural projects were the numerous industrial projects scattered over the length and breadth of Nigeria. And ladies and gentlemen, please take particular note of what I'm about to say. Next. In one frenetic burst of energy, a wave of maniacal and frenzy activity was going on all over Eastern Nigeria. As a book on Dr. Obara reminds us, by January 25, 1963, the Michelin factory at Port Harcourt was opened. The entire factory was a US $3 million undertaken. On March 22 of the same year, the headquarters building of the Universal Insurance Company was opened in Enugu. On May 10, the Nigerian gas factory was commissioned at MNN near Enugu. On May 16, the aluminum factory at Port Harcourt was opened. On August 14, the glass factory became operative in Port Harcourt. On October 18, the asbestos cement factory was opened in MNN. On November 9, the foundation of the central bank was laid in Port Harcourt. On November 30, the Golden Guinea Breweries was commissioned at Umahia for the production of lager beer and allied products. On December 13, Hotel Presidential was opened at a whopping cost of 2 million British pounds. So the burning fire for industrialization led to the establishment of the modern ceramic industry in Umahia, textile mills at Aba and Onisha, and a shoe factory in Oweri. There was a catalog of numerous small industries that were also established simultaneously with the major ones during this time. It was during this period that the first phase of the farm settlements scheme were established in Ulona, in Umahia province, or Haji in Oweri province, Ibarriam in Onisha, Boki in Ogoja, Uzuwan in Enugu province, Abak in Anang province. Each was to accommodate over 5,000 farmers. And what was remarkable was a scrupulous effort to ensure even spread of these settlements throughout the length and breadth of the region. All these activities have been elaborated in his vision for the development of the region after general elections in 1961. I'm going to skip some of the things I have to say, but I need to point out the very strong engagement he had with the private sector. As he observed, to achieve rapid economic growth and raise the standard of living of the people, it was necessary that private, in the midst of rampaging risk factors, a remarkable aspect of industrialization plan was a collaboration and cooperation with foreign investors to undertake the large industries such as the Michelin Tire Factory in Port Harcourt and the Nkalago Cement Factory in present day Ebon State. Indeed, Obara's plan, his vision, was that the entire corridor coming from Port Harcourt 
through Aba to Okigwe to Owere uh, to Enugu onwards to Nsoka was going to be a megapolis a major industrial city all these things were clearly articulated in the plan that they had at the time it was also during the same time that the University of Nigeria was conceived and executed all of these things were done under the auspices of the Eastern Nigeria Development Commission, ENDC. And what was even more incredible for me was that he brought in, he had some arrowheads. And so he seated the day today running party to his old friend, Dr. Elsin Mbanugo. The civil service allowed Oti to deal with it. The intelligentsia he left to Professor Carlo Ezera and the economic domain to Sir Louis Odumegu Sr. These were his kitchen cabinet, as it were, and beyond the former structures of the party and the bureaucracy. And so in the final analysis, ladies and gentlemen, Obara's success rested on his understanding of his people and the operative environment that shaped him and his people. In conclusion, I want to say that Dr. Obara's achievements were not happenstance. The quality and the flawless execution of his plans suggested that he came to government with a purpose. His personality, his overall comportment and achievement suggest a deep consciousness about his reason for being. Michael Obara's success exemplifies for us what good leadership should be and how it is delivered. He had a clear vision which matched the task at hand. He organized to get the right people and empowered them to join the effort. And he employed his organizational skills to ensure that the actions of his government and the people working with him were consistent with the vision. Now, I hadn't read much about his time in government when I made the following submission during the 2014 National Conference in Abuja. Nigeria cannot develop by accident. No nation has and can develop by accident. The old and the new civilizations that we aspire to be like were not built by accident. They were not built by mediocres. Kleptomaniacs did not build them. Ethnic and religious irredentists did not build them. Visionaries who were disciplined built them. They were built through a conscious and dedicated effort anchored on deep commitment to the welfare and well-being of their people and their place in the world. These nations have continued to make progress for the same considerations today. I would like, therefore like to, from this podium, to challenge all the leaders of our people, Ndibonile, that what we need and what we must demand and what all of us must work for is another Michael Opara moment. We need the rebirth of vision and courage, determination and industry, ambition and success to create an Aladimma worth of the, worthy of the potentials that the Almighty has so generously endowed on our people. But the truth is that the Igbo Renaissance has already started. The Igbo Renaissance has started. It has started because of the vision of young Igbo men and women, some of who were not even born during the Civil War, most of who did not participate in the war. But who believe that we need to tell our story? Who believe that the Igbo need to tell their story? Who believe that the Igbo should have a voice? Who believe that we have a responsibility to the upcoming generations? And it is for this reason that I'd like to pay my deep respect to the Center for Memories and, of course, to Nkatu Organization of Nkatumibe for leading this renaissance. And to the young people in this room, just a parting shot. The future is in our hands. The future is in your hands. I believe that you have opportunity to decide those you would like to look up to. And I want to urge you not to be carried away by the lure or lure of power. 
do not be carried away by the allure of power. And when you look at our political leadership, there are certain things that clearly do not constitute good examples. And I urge you not to follow them. I believe that you have opportunity to chart a course for yourself. As the evil that you are, it's in our DNA. And I want you to never underestimate the power of your voice. Because as Barack Obama said, some time back, one voice can change a room. And if one voice can change a room, that same voice can change a city. If that voice can change a city, that voice can change a state. And if that voice can change a state, it can change a nation. And if that voice can change a nation, it can change the world. So as a matter of fact, you have so much power. And I believe that you can build the future that you want. You can join hands collectively to build the future that the southeast region of Nigeria is deserving of. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank Mweke III. When we invited you to deliver this, we knew you would deliver. I was only worried how long we can stay and listen to you because we almost wouldn't want to stop listening to you. Thank you very much once again. Another round of applause for him. This is Nkata Mwebe. It's a conversation. And so we've heard from our distinguished speaker, it is time for us to have an interaction around the topic he has spoken about. And let us tease it out and hopefully leave here today with a few <laughs> actionable points on the questions he raised, on the points he, have, he has noted. It is leadership we need. And to moderate that interactive session, I want to invite the General Secretary of National Think Tank and Executive Vice Chairman, Geokinetic, Jerome Okolo, please. Divine Day One. Um, it's almost difficult to follow that to the force, but um, we promised you a conversation, so we will have a conversation. And we will try and tease out some of those moments that Frank Mweke, due to the limited time given him, had to um, go over quickly. We will try and slow down some very pertinent moments so we can draw some deeper lessons. Um, just before we start, I just want to give a very quick, uh, um, albeit incomplete, summary of, um, of his uh, conversation. He set the context for us for the current Igbo leadership crisis. I don't think there's anybody here who does not understand or cannot feel the crisis that is the absence of the type of leadership that Frank Mweke goes on to describe in his eloquent lecture to us tonight. He drew on the perspectives of leadership, tried to point out to, especially the young ones here, what leadership actually is and how leadership is exercised. And the fact that your position is not the only mark of your ability to exercise leadership. You can exercise leadership from wherever you find yourself. He then went on to describe the current state of affairs in our national uh, position in Nigeria, the lack of cohesive and collective Igbo political leadership, and then went on to draw on the example of Rwanda, a country that came out from something similarly de destructive and devastating as the Igbos came through in the Civil War, although theirs was very short, only 100 days compared to the three and a half years that the Igbos had to endure the Civil War. He then points out that the claims of Igbo marginalization might not be all it's um, 
made out to be, that it's actually sometimes a case of poverty of riches, that we are, as the Igbo proverb will say, sometimes in the river, but our eyes are full of soap, and there's water all around us. It's a question of how do we use what we have to get what we want. It then gives the example, the lessons, and the parallels with Yoruba political leadership and how the Yorubas have managed to make the best of the cards that have been dealt to them. Finally, he charts a road to Igbo political renaissance, drawing on, again, the Yoruba experience where they have deployed the attributes of wisdom, patience, sophistication, sagacity in the exercise of collective political leadership. Finally, he reminds us that things have not always been like this, that we once were a very great and proud and high-achieving nation. Draws on the Okbara years, the remarkable achievement of five eventful years, and made that resounding call at the end of his uh, paper for us to have another Michael Okbara moment in Igbo land. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, I call on all of you to again give Mr. Frank Mweke a resounding round of applause. So I, I will ask um, a couple of questions to kick off uh, the question and answer series. When I'm done with my questions, I will call on two questions from one side of the hall and another two questions from another side of the hall. And then Mr. Mweke will take those four questions and then we'll try the same thing perhaps another couple of times. So Frank, um, on the one hand, you pointed out that for anyone to be called a leader and to be acknowledged as one on an ongoing basis, such an individual must embrace a critical consciousness that enables him or her to commit their entire life, not four years, but their entire life to the service of people at whatever level they find themselves. But further on in your paper, you list a whole host of stellar Igbo sons and daughters whose achievements have shone brightly around the world, but whose influence have been relatively short-lived. So how do we create the conditions in Igbo land to enable our bright comets to turn into long, shining stars whose influence can endure and permeate and encourage the generations that come after them. Well, thank you very much. Um, again, uh, welcome to the people who joined us uh, not too long ago. Um, well, I did point out that I have a problem with the attribution of the uh, description of leadership to only people in the more public roles. I made it very, very clear that as, as individuals, as professionals, as parents, mothers, fathers, uncles, monitors, uh, gate men, these are all uh, leaders. But since you make reference to the more uh, uh, senior, uh, the more, uh, what did you call them? Did you say stellar professionals? I believe that uh, it is important to interrogate the circumstances of their emergence, right? So someone does not become a professor of medicine by just uh, pussyfooting. Someone does not become a professor of economics just by uh, pussyfooting. It takes intense commitment. It takes some kind of training from the family. It takes also uh, some kind of nurture from the family. And so I want to take this opportunity, actually, to make a very strong call to parents to really pay attention to what our children, what is going on with our children. We must take interest in the total well-being of these children to really nurture them in every sense of the word and to prepare them uh, for the future. There's none of these things that can happen by accident. And so I believe that if these children are nurtured, if they're educated, if they are guided, that ultimately, as the Bible says, that if you teach the child the path in which you want him to grow, in his old age he will not depart from it. And so I believe that um, um, even as uh, our young people are fascinated with uh, public office holders, when they're... That when they have heard about the exploits of uh, thoroughbred professionals, that they are also uh, fascinated. Um, 
I'm sure you are conversant with the work of Daniel Coleman, who writes in the Harvard Business Review that successful leaders, truly successful leaders, show emotional intelligence, trustworthiness, self-management, and internal motivation from deep-held beliefs and optimism in the face of adversity. Who is your most admired current leader in Iboland? <laughs> That's a difficult one. <laughs> That's a very difficult one. Yeah? That's a very difficult one. Um, so, who is my most admired current Igbo leader? I, I, can leave you to, I can leave you to think about that question because I think we would all benefit from your answer. I'm not letting you off the hook. You will still answer this question at any point in the next 30 minutes. But um, I want to ask you another direct question to Frank Mweke. Can you please share with us your vision for an Igbo land that will make Frank Mweke happy and proud? Well, I, I want to, I mean, I have no, absolutely no difficulty in going straight to that question, or to the answer to that question. But uh, for me, I, I'll be most, um, nothing will make me happier than to live in an Igbo land that is secure. Uh, an Igbo land that is um, um, with the right kind of uh, leadership at every level, whether it's in the business sector, in the political sector, whether, you know, um, an Igbo land in which the infrastructure is world class, an Igbo land where we are confident of who we are as a people, an Igbo land where we respect elders, an Igbo land where there is, you know, um, where we um, subscribe to, to, to the egalitarian principles of our forefathers. Igwe biike, you know, oyanga na one year, ebe belu, ugo belu, in case na one year amambe, nyakwa jie. That's the kind of Igbo land that I want to see. I want to see an Igbo land where leaders understand what it means to serve in its truest essence. I want to see an Igbo land where young people, young people are consciously prepared for the future. There is currently a disconnect between the generations. There is currently a disconnect. There are a lot of things that I see today that are alien to our culture. And you cannot blame these young people because clearly, clearly, if you don't train up that child, when he grows up, there's no way that he has nothing to stay on. He has nothing to remember. And I make the point that everything that I am today, the way in which I carry myself, the way in which I sound, even the, even the fact that I wear a watch on my wrist hand, on my right hand, is because of what I observed from my father. It's because of a mother who was uh, uh, an executioner, literally. She was vicious. Those are the kinds of things that shaped me. And so I'm, I just keep coming back to that the issue of parenting. But I believe that an Igbo land where even our young people are prepared for the future, our young people are respected, and our young people are trained to really take leadership when the time uh, comes. This is the kind of Igbo land that I, I would like to see. My name is Eber Okoye. Um, thank you, Mr. Frank, for the wonderful lecture you gave us this evening. And I have um, some few points that I want you to buttress on. Um, firstly, you talked about um, women participation in politics. And truthfully, it's been something that in the Southeast as entirely, women are not really encouraged to go into politics. So they are either wearing wrapper to one political rally or the other, or they are singing praises for one political um, person or the other. And most of the times when I ask questions about these things, I found out that because it's of its stereotype that women who are in politics are prostitutes or they're not responsible. Personally, I was in a meeting where CSOs were gathered and they were asking questions, why are women not in politics? And the guys were like, what do they want to do in politics? How can the men sit at home? And the women will go and lead them. That it's not an Igbo thing. So I want to know if women in leadership, it's an Igbo thing and how we can make that work. Secondly, you've talked about the Igbo of your dream. I want to recall or maybe I want, I want to recant the Igbo that we are seeing now. 
the kind of politics and leadership we're seeing now is the politics where they pay our youth to use images on Google to campaign for things that have not been done, promises that have not been met. The leadership we're seeing now is where we pay our youth to defend the, the, the kind of attempts they make to defend people that are not worth their defense. This is the kind of leadership we're seeing now. So now that you've talked about the Igbo of your dream, what do you think we should do to apply the Igbo of your dream? What process do you think we should take? I am Charejo Gebo. Ani ukuma ke okundi Igbo. And mak ani ukuma ke ya, onyo obu na poto okorigi nandi Igbo ge emenka emenka. Na li Igbo, na ndorondoro o chichi, ke edu nto na landi Igbo sto, onwe ha. Onwe na ajo gese, di ko onye jibugoro okwa o chichi, atu li li aka atu, atu yon riga aka atu li, apu roke ke ega chia, di ka onye minister, no lundi beke. Ke edu hendi Igbo ngwe riki ime, can you want to know the Yoruba Bidoria from AD? Mabundo Yibo, Tinubu Ekweha, Titana Tinubu Megidia, 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 Ubua, Pati Tinubu na Chitna, La Yoruba Nile, Kedi Hendi Bomori Kime, Pati Hendi Kendi Bo as no Wabga, Awala, Ebendur Nandiama, Na Azwa here, Ne Gutanazo, Kedi Hain Weri Kime, Kayum Mwe Mwe. Ntonala, ndi bogeji, wewe kutoa hana na njiri ya kelemge. Okay. Oh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Frank Wicker, for the wonderful talk. Um, I just have a few questions. Um, personally, okay, my name is Chibwes. There will be George, a medical lab scientist. Uh, personally, I have observed something about um, the Igbo nation, which I would like to address about the economy. We are more selfish in our economy and not a, a community driven economy most of the Igbos for me they, they, they drive more on personal achievements rather than depending on how can we develop the economy of the Igbos so how do you think we can achieve a, a, an economy that is community based then secondly the, my question is I've observed also after I've lived in the north, I've seen how easy and accessible the leaders of, the, especially the northern, as they are the leader, they are very accessible. But I've observed that most of our Igbo leaders, they are hardly accessible. That, there is no that mentorship. Once that person is, just like you say about Michael Opera, he is gone. Who else have been mentored in that aspect? So I want to say that, how can this mentorship of the young ones be more practicalized? That we, we are advising the young to become good. How can those in power now, whether in, in politics, in business, or any aspect, even in education, how can they bring up these young ones and mentor them and carry them along and make this young one to be more better than them in the future? Thank you very much. All right. Uh, All right. So I have just uh, one question. And uh, when Mr. Frank was speaking, he. I think he started with uh, security, and uh, that's a burning question in the minds of a lot of young people, especially uh, those of us who live here in the southeast. And of course, with the recent program that almost happened, uh, the Ruga. Now we look up to the persons we consider leaders in the southeast. For example, what has happened in Enugu in the past few days, and the position that we see our governor take which uh, appears to be very unpopular with the people. Now, when there are policies that seem to threaten the very security of our people, how do we respond? Uh, do we just uh, maybe keep quiet and accept whatever it is the governor and the leaders say? Or do we try something different? So I think this is one uh, very simple question I'm yet to find an answer to because uh, in all that has happened, we have not found a solution to the insecurity, especially in these parts. There is an invasion happening and we can feel it. We see this on a day-to-day -day basis. So as young people, what do we do? Leave the country or stay and fight? <laughs> well, um, okay, so if we just settle down. Well, thank you so much to, for all these questions. Um, starting with uh, Ebere Okoli. I want to say clearly 
that I am not aware. I'm not aware of anything in Igbo culture which says that women cannot participate in politics. I'm also not aware of anything in our culture which abhors or appears to discourage the leadership of women in uh, Igbo land. And I want to say clearly that irrespective of what may be available or not available, if the women are good enough to be our mothers, if they are good enough to be our daughters, if they are good enough to be our wives, if they are good enough to be our friends and associates, then they are good enough to lead us as well. And so, Ebere, uh, like you, I am very concerned about the role that young people play in our polity sometimes. And that is their amenability to use, uh, their amenability to, to, to be used as thugs, as thugs and as praise singers to their exclusion in the mainstream political process. But you know, there's something that uh, President Bassanjo used to say when I was in the cabinet. Because we were pretty young, a couple of us were, a handful of us were quite young. So each time he would see us, he would say, the young shall grow, the young shall grow. And so um, I believe that there's a natural order of things. Maybe it's from observation, from even singing, from even attending rallies, you could learn one or two things to enable you to get into mainstream politics, if that is your interest. But let me also bring another dimension to it. And that is my concern about this tendency for young people to believe that the only way to make it in life is by going to politics. And I'm saying that that is unfortunate. That should not be the case. Government in politics is very serious business. It's very serious business. And I don't know if you recall what happened. Prof is here. But it was very interesting that during the last uh, election, in the run-up to the elections, when there was a national debate, there were all sorts of people that came out, young stars, who said they were running for president. And two things came to mind. First of all, I just liked the audacity that they had to aspire. I thought that was fantastic. But when I listened to them in the course of the debates, I said, oh my God, what did these people think that running a country is about? And it was clear that they were impatient. It was clear that they had no understanding of the issues around economy, issues around politics, issues around education and healthcare. Even their comportment, even their ability to really, in a logical manner, articulate their position. However, pedestrian scene, uh, it, it appeared, was totally lacking. And so I just want to urge you that, you know, uh, it's important to balance all of these issues as you aspire and as you participate and as you eventually engage in uh, politics. How can the evil land of my dream be achieved? And I want to say to you that, you know what, um, the way our country is and the way most societies are set up, Government is there to cater to the welfare, the well-being of the people. And that, that welfare and the well-being can only be achieved through certain structures. Structures built around health, the hospitals. Structures built around education. Structures built around security. Structures built around skills development and the rest of them. And so the quality of the outcomes from these structures or the impact of these structures on the, on the life of any society depends on the quality of leadership that you elect or nominate or appoint to manage these, um, uh, these affairs. And so it is important to my mind that Igbos begin to pay more attention to the process of selecting these uh, leaders. It's extremely important that we pay attention to the process of selecting these leaders. And when we have selected them, then we must also consider supporting them as much as we can. 
in order for us to bring about change. The next question, somebody asks, how can uh, Ndibu build a viable political party or vehicle to come to power? You know, I drew, I, I went down memory lane and I, I, I dwelt copiously on the experience of the Southwest. First of all, you have to, we have to be content, we have to learn contentment. We have to learn contentment. What has happened in the last say, uh, two election cycles, to my mind, shows that the Igbos know what they don't want. There's been some consistency. The Igbos have demonstrated that they know what they don't want. Without apology, the next step must then be having shown that you don't want this. You must be ready to turn your back completely. You must, ready to, you must be ready to build the alternative that you require. And so that if we have thrown, uh, if we have cast our lot with a particular political party, then we must have the discipline. We must have, must have the restraint, the self-control, the tenacity to remain with that party. We must, do that. we must do that. Otherwise, if you're swinging from place to place, then you're going to be up for grabs. Everybody knows that, okay, these guys are never serious. So what's the, what's the price? And it, it's very distressing for me personally that Igbos are generally perceived as being available to be bought, to be purchased. That is the general perception amongst the political class from other parts of the country. And so when there are important political issues to be discussed, we're not even factored into it because they believe that, no, don't worry, when it's time, we're going to just, we know what to do. Now, that is totally abhorrible to me. And I believe that the Igbo political elite are the ones who must, who must, do something about it. I, for one, personally, since 1999, I have been in the People's Democratic Party. And in spite of offers, calls, delegations led to me to join one thing or the other, I declined because political parties do not build themselves. It is people that build political parties. So if there's anything wrong with your political party, then you have opportunity to say, okay, where did we go wrong? How can we reinvent ourselves and then try to see how you can improve and renew your contract with the people and then go for it again? That is exactly what the Southwest did. And that is what the Southeast must do if we want to come back to reckoning in our country. Well, somebody spoke about um, uh, indeed we're more selfish than communal. How can we be more community-based? You know, um, Igbos are individualistic but Igbos are also communal maybe I'm speaking from both sides of my mouth but I do know that today the very nature of our, of our extended family system shows that we are our brother's keeper yes we like to achieve but having achieved we usually do not want to leave we usually do not want to leave our brothers behind and so I may not completely agree with you that, um, you know, um, Igbos are selfish. That might not be the way to describe it. We're individualistic, we like to achieve, but we're also our brother's keeper. We're also our brother's keeper. Say so northern elders are more accessible than Igbo leaders. I think it's a matter of opinion. It's a matter of opinion. Because politics is about people. And so if you choose to make yourself unavailable, then there are consequences. And I believe that it is in the interest of any good politician, anyone who aspires to public leadership, to actually make him or herself available as much as possible so that, you know, you, you bond with the people and uh, you don't wait until it's election time before you now start looking for the people. It's extremely important that this uh, happens. How can they mentor the young? Okay, the issue of mentoring the young. Well, again, this is a conversation that you must have with uh, the potential uh, mentor. Huh? But I do know that, uh, based on my personal experience, there are some people that approach you to mentor them either politically or in business. Then the next thing that has happened is that they want to put all their problems on you. They want to run you out of town. They begin to you know, um, make life unbearable for you. So it's, it's a balancing act at all times. 
But I believe that um, it, it is the responsibility of the political elite and professionals to actually mentor as many people as is possible, that they can possibly mentor and manage in the context of their, you know, how much time they have and how, more, how available uh, they can be at any time. He said, what, on the matter of security, what should the people do when the elected governors appear to be taking positions that appear contrary to Ubo security? Leave the country and stay and fight our political leaders if they do, if they represent us well. Well, um, I believe that uh, leadership and followership is shared responsibility. You have the responsibility to hold your leadership accountable, your leaders accountable. So if someone has our mandate as governor, has our mandate as president, if that person begins to do what is clearly not in our uh, either regional interest or even uh, national interest, citizens have a responsibility to really hold that person to account. And I believe that that is what happened in the case of Ruga. I think that the national outcry, the national outcry from every nook and cranny of this country was, it was part of what contributed to the um, rescinding of, or the suspension of the Ruga uh, initiative, as just uh, as an example. And I believe that even the governors of the Southeast, whatever they were thinking, um, they had to uh, uh, make a retreat once they heard the uh, pushback from uh, the people of the Southeast. So, and the question of running away, run away to where? There's even no place to run away to anymore because Europe is closing their doors, America is closing its doors. I mean, almost every part of the country, is, uh, part of the world, everyone is closing their doors. There's this, you know, nationalistic favor. So I'm not even sure that uh, we have opportunity to run away to anywhere anymore. And so as a matter of fact, I'm going to uh, really uh, remind you of what General Buhari said when he was, uh, general, uh, when he was uh, head of state in 1983, which is that we have no other country but Nigeria and we need to stay back here and start veggie together. The same way we have no other states apart from the southeast uh, states. And we need to stay back here and salvage it together. Okay? Thank you. Um, okay. uh, my name is Comrade Tony Ude, the Social Secretary in the Sports Club. Frank Mweke, you are welcome. Your thesis was quite eliciting. So we are working our consciousness the Igbo Renaissance. Man is to contribute, not ask questions. You made mention about M. I. Obara in his heydays. Obara was a selfless leader. It might interest this assembly of people here that Obara, as a leader of the Eastern region, had no single building here in Enugu by the time he died. When Obara died in 1984, he, he had no building. It was the military administrators of the then Anambra Imo that collected money to build a house for him in Umahia. I think Aneke Azemilad was part of that project. Our own leaders presently are very selfish. And we cannot move forward by being selfish leaders. So I'm, as a, I'm of the opinion that for the Igbos to rebound and to resurge uh, in the polity of this country, we must have to come together as one block, forgetting our localities. What happened a few months ago when Peter Obi was nominated as the vice president to Atiku? There was mayhem in the southeast. People criticizing why should it be OB? Blah 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 blah. Onyaga na one year. If it were to be a blind man and was support a blind man, the Igbos can move forward. Thank you. Observation is I heard you say something about family upbringing and how it influences a child's growth in life, and I want to say that. A lot of persons are not privileged to be from these functioning families. A lot of children are not out of their own fault from dysfunctional families. And I believe that in such areas where there are deficiencies in families, the educational sector is supposed to make up for such deficiencies. And here in the Southeast, it's been observed that public schools 
which sort of accommodates these people from poor families or dysfunctional backgrounds are not efficient. Public primary schools are in a very bad state. And then it brings me again to where you talked about accountability. How do we hold leaders accountable? Not just for the sake of talking and uh, making noise on social media. How do we hold leaders accountable to achieve results? Because I had an experience when I was in university. We had some delays and then we had to write to the school. And even after writing to the um, student affairs to get things done, it seemed like we were working against ourselves. So recently, I, I thought of taking a project and I went to a school. At some point, I sort of lost direction because I was thinking of the best possible way to go to make sure that what I want to achieve is achieved. So what's the best way to hold leaders accountable in order to achieve results? Thank you. A few minutes ago, the anchor asked Mr. Frank Weke, who is his most admired Igbo leaders? And to a reasonable extent, I drew silence in that and uh, I asked myself such questions. And I came to find that to a bewilderness, no. And uh, it's just a reason that the quality of leadership has fallen drastically. Now, my question is how do we resurrect that spirit of pan Africanism that, that anchored and uh, drove? Zeke of Africa that anchored and drove the mentality of Michael Obara and how do we as youths be groomed to move forward and have uh, um, uh, thank you my name is John Uchenna and each other it's in this program in this seminar I heard the former uh, minister say that the Ruga that uh, the southeasterners in the north have been asked to leave. I have not heard it before. So what is the government? Can you tell us what the government of Enugu State and by extension, the southeastern government are doing to accommodate the people that might likely start leaving the southeast while we pray that it doesn't split our country? Thank you. Um, I, I dare say that Opera's achievement remains untrammeled in Igbo land. So the quick question is, do you think we can be able to replicate what Opera did without some form of Igbo consciousness in our leadership? Thank you. Che Gabriel, I'm a broadcaster. I'm particularly bothered about the cost of living in the Southeast. Uh, people say come back home, people say um, develop the place. The cost of living is crazy here. Talk about schooling, school fees. And so you see a lot of Southeasterners in the West, in the North. And uh, when you talk about it, people say uh, with, with what you used to pay salary for three, I mean school fees for three people in the North, it's just one school fees for one person in a suit here. So shouldn't we be talking about the cost of living as well? And then uh, my question is like, uh, you know, the boys are very hardworking, very enterprising, but I've come to realize that uh, most often when we go to Lagos, you discover like the Alaba International that is Ibos that uh, build the place, you go to computer village, you go to Abuja, but it's surprising that when you come to Dan East here, they are finding it difficult to come here and invest. That uh, the environment is not profitable, or because they say charity begins at home. But, and that's why when it comes to during the election, they now remind us that we are visitors, especially in Lagos. So does it mean that we both our charity is also, instead of beginning at home, it's beginning abroad. So that's my question. Thank you. It's uh, Engineer Chukuma Unije. I'm a power consultant. And um, during your presentation, Mr. Frank Mweke, you made mention about the political dispositions of the Igbos as being Republicans in nature. 
how do you think we can harmonize this our republican disposition with the new renaissance you are now trying to ignite in the consciousness of our political disposition in nigeria thank you Biko, um, it's just an observation, not a question. Onwe yende bae na, but onwe one saying, ane yuku, asi dat na, ibo, so onye jego. And that is the problem we have, like I said, it's an observation. That's the problem we have in this part of, in fact, in Nigeria as a whole, but I'm bringing it down to the Ibo environment. Because you see someone that doesn't have capacity to rule or to lead, but because he knows that the masses are hungry. Because every, each and every one of us has a price tag, no matter how little, no matter how big. So he tends to exploit our, he tends to exploit, um, tends to exploit people based on their price tag. So in essence, I'm saying we need to also check our value system for this leadership to work. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nkem Anwe Yago. And um, I have just a comment or so. Because when uh, Mr. Nweke spoke, he won my heart when he talked about the father being his mentor. And uh, what occurred to me is that we are just scratching the surface of the problem of bad leadership in our society. And that is the address of the role of women in the upbringing of our children. Womanhood, very important. I beg to disagree with the earlier speaker, a lady, a woman like me, who talked about women in politics. It's not as if I don't like women to be in politics. But do first things first. The first thing is the upbringing of our children. Is the raising of our children. Women should be in the forefront of the raising of our children from cradle because this is where leadership starts. Not in politics. I beg to disagree. Pardon me if I disagree with you. But you see, what I saw, I am a kind of refugee from the north. My first observation when I came here to Enugu, by the way, I'm a, a, a retiree. I'm a pensioner. And when I came here and I saw would I call it a bit of decadence in most of our girls and women? It was shocking. First of all, it started with the mode of our dressing. Women should dress properly. <laughs> to be able to lead our children into proper leadership. What are you trying to teach a child when you are not properly dressed? Women should be the foundation of building up leaders. And it should start from the southeast. The idea of, I, I was forced when I came, my, my children had to restrain me actually to stop a few girls on the street and say, what you are wearing is not good. My children warned me that I'll get some slap. But I didn't mind. Some girls listened to me. I was, my first port of call was M MTN. And I saw a girl with a very ugly looking uh, outfit. And I called her and I said, please, this your outfit is not very good. She said, eh, do I want her to wear uh, uh, a long dress like me. I say, no. Let's agree. Make a compromise. Just make it a bit below the knee. She said, no. Nope. This was bought for me by the person who loves me. I said, okay. 
But what I'm trying to say, let me cut it short, actually, is that women must learn. Women must learn to bring up children in the right way. First of all, before we talk of leadership. Thank you. Okay, well... <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can you move your camera so I can see mommy very well? Thank you. Well, I'm going to start from the last set of comments. If we would just come down, if we would come down, could we please come down so we can respond to the questions? Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Ms. Zane Yago for the very important comments that she made. I agree with her completely that women, our mothers, have a very special role to play in the upbringing of children. Mothers have a very special relationship with children through conception, through gestation, through birth through breastfeeding, through nurture, and general upbringing. Women have very important relationship with children. And I agree that they are probably better placed than the men by the very nature of their psychology, their physiology, to bring up their children. And I can never stop pointing back pointing at my own upbringing and the special relationship I continue to enjoy with my mother, who is now 75. I continue to enjoy that relationship with her. Even though when we were growing up, we thought she was uh, one of the most wicked people that ever lived. She was the provost marshal. But I think that we look back today and we are the better for it. Having said that, um, I want to add that I'm not, uh, I didn't fail to observe that the, um, the greatest applause to what mommy said came from the men. And I don't know whether, I don't know the basis of that. I don't know what, I don't know what they found excited about your response. Whether they were applauding you for altruistic reasons or whether they were altruistic, uh, uh, applauding you um, as a, um, for arming them uh, for the argument they're going to have with their wives tonight when they go home and how they are going to continue to oppress them. But let me make the point that, yes, you can bring up your children. You can teach them how to behave, how to dress, how to carry themselves, how to comport themselves. But for the girls in particular, um, I, I, I expect that mothers would also teach them about self-confidence, that mothers would also teach them about courage, that mothers would also teach them about responsibility, and that mothers will also teach them about leadership. And so you can, um, you can um, embrace um, uh, uh, or you can integrate good moral upbringing with also good preparation for leadership and for life and for responsibility in the larger society. And so for the young women in the house, don't get uh, discouraged. Yes, Mr. Ane Yago is very, very uh, correct. We expect you to dress properly. It is civil. It is respectable for you to do so, but uh, you should also uh, continue to aspire. But uh, create a balance in both your family life and then those uh, aspirations. Uh, Comrade Dude, well, yes, as a matter of fact, you know, one thing that was not pointed out is this. Uh, Dr. Opara, went to, was educated in uh, Yaba, what is now today Yaba, Co Yaba College of uh, Technology. And then uh, subsequently, after the Civil War, when he left, when he had left office, after the Civil War, he actually went back to medical school. He actually went back to medical school and eventually graduated as a, as a medical doctor, which is why he was known as Dr. Michael uh, Obara. He went back to medical school. And then subsequently, he went to exile. He was in exile in Ireland. And then when he returned in 1979, as Mr. Uday said, he had no home. He returned to his father's home. It was friends who then contributed money to build him a bungalow in his uh, hometown. That was the 
the nature of his uh, character, the integrity that he, he that was a hallmark of his life. And so, for me, I was very, I remain very fascinated just by the life of that man and the historic, historical accounts of his experiences. Yes, the issue of uh, Peter B's uh, nomination um, showed selfless, selfishness starkly. Well, I don't know whether you were here when I was talking about uh, extreme republicanism. I think extreme republicanism, almost a deliberate and conscious effort. It's almost like it's impossible for us to build a consensus on anything. Even if the group interest is going to be destroyed, it's going to be sacrificed. That is the nature of the Igbo man. It appears to be something in our DNA, something about who we are, the way we are created. Almost self-destructing in our disposition. Fatalistic republicanism. This is what I call it. And so you're right. And, uh, but it's also important to say that in spite of all of that, the mass of the people, the populace, the citizens, still rose up to the occasion by casting their votes to say, well, the political elite may have their say, but we are going to have our way. That's exactly what it is. And that is why I say that leadership and followership is shared responsibility. It's shared responsibility. And somebody was asking, how do you hold leaders to account? That was one brilliant, one beautiful way to hold leaders to account. That you felt, well, you have heard what they've said, you don't agree, you had the opportunity to show you didn't agree, and you did that through the ballot box. That is one very important way to hold leaders account at the ballot box, at the elections. You hold them to account. And I say to you, Yes, you say, don't say making noise in social media. Yes, I agree. Um, I look at social media. Sometimes there are all sorts of things that go on there that I find very disturbing. But um, mobilizing through social media, you know, again, is consistent with uh, the developments in technology in the 21st century. And so there are things that have happened which have actually have, uh, had impact in the larger society. And I, I, I insist that the Ruga settlement, right, through uh, the, 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 the protestations, through the public, uh, uh, th through the traditional media, the electronic media, and then also through uh, even outright protests by people all over the country, as well as the, uh, the uh, conversations on social media, all served to really bring pressure on government to, uh, to, 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 uh, to abolish or suspend the Ruga Settlement uh, Initiative. And so, do not despair. Don't, don't give up. You may not always win. Sometimes, yes, the, the, the political leadership might still go ahead and do whatever they want to do. But the public records will show where you stand, what you did, and what the mass of people did when those issues were on the table. <laughs> well, somebody was asking, how do you resurrect the spirit of uh, Obara and Azikiwe? Well, <laughs> well, there is just a little, just a little humor, but... Uh, I guess we can consult the oracles to know. To <laughs> but, I mean, I do get where you're going. But, you see, I believe that the, the, the uh, Michael Obara spirit is here tonight with us. I believe that tonight we've resurrected it. It's here. It's awakened. Because I, I don't know how many people were already aware of the things that I shared about his life and about his achievements. And what that story told me when I saw it, and I was seeing those things for the first time, was that we can, actually, we can actually have public servants who understand service in its truest essence, who understand what public service means, and who can go see and conquer and then come back on scathe. And the people are happy for what they did. And the people remember them with great respect and fondness. That is what the Michael Obara story has told me. So I, I want to urge all of you, those of you who, are, who remain in public leadership or who aspire to public leadership, that you may find guidance from the life of Michael Obara, that when you get into those positions, or even whether, wherever you are today, if you're in a position to serve the public, that I encourage you to be guided by what Michael Obara did, by his humility, by his intellect and his vision, by his selflessness, by the respect he showed the people, by the, by the impact that he created. That's the only way, really, that you can really resurrect his spirit. And he wasn't the only one. There were also other people that came after him. The second class of, or the third class of governors after the, um, after the Civil War, Jim Wobodo, for instance, they did a lot. Uh, uh, Chief um, Mbakwe in, uh, in uh, Imo State did a lot. And sometimes you look back today and you're almost in tears that the same state governed by Mbakwe, eh, the two states of Abia and Imo, where he reigned 
and where he did so much, he left such a great legacy, was completely undermined by some people that have come behind him. Then look, let's look at the state. I mean, look at some of these states today. Through how many governors? And then what has happened to, you know, just, you know, uh, in those states? And you see that there are people. More recently in Enugu State, you can look, you know, think about other people. Chimaro Kinnamani, he was my boss. I was the chief of staff. And every, with every sense of modesty, I think that there are things that you can point back to and say, yes, that these were worthy achievements. And perhaps in other states of the Southeast, you can point back and say these were worthy achievements. And um, I hope that we can draw lessons from those achievements and aspire to do better where it is uh, possible. Somebody wanted to talk about, oh, wow. Okay. Somebody wanted me to talk about uh, how they're going to accommodate Igbo returnees sent home. Well, you know, um, the, 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 the situation, really, when I saw that video, the video giving ultimatum to sitting governors, so how dare they support or how dare they challenge the Ruga initiative and threatening that they were being given 30 days to reverse themselves, otherwise action will be taken. I was emotionally devastated about the level to which we have degenerated. If that is not treason, I don't know what else is treason. Such blatant and impudent challenge to state authority. In a functional state, those people should be arrested. In fact, they will not leave where they made that announcement. But that is not the case today. And we've seen it again and again and again. I hope I'm, we're proved wrong. We hope that things, something will happen in the coming days and weeks. We hope that the government of Nigeria will show that they're actually in existence. And we hope that President Buhari will show that he's the president and commander-in-chief of this country. We, show that pres we hope that President Buhari will demonstrate that he understands that as president, that the welfare, the security, and the well-being of our people are the most important, the most basic responsibilities of a president. We hope so. And of course, if I was a sitting governor today, I'd be mindful of what is going on. And if nothing else, I will begin to do whatever I need to do to prepare in the event, just in case, these threats materialize. Yeah, so somebody said, is it possible to rebuild the, um, to have a New York moment without be rebuilding political consciousness? My, my, my answer is, 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 is actually, I don't know how to answer this, but I think my answer is, um, is, is no. But you see, I think it's about your, your understanding, your, your understanding of what service means. What, why do you want to come to government? Are you, going to, are, you, are you coming to government because you believe it's the shortest cut to wealth? Are you coming to really and truly serve? It's important. And so, before that political consciousness, you need to have a, a personal critical consciousness about your purpose, who you are, what you want to do, what you even want to be remembered for. Because, Michael, I, what, what, I, what I shared with you was a highly abridged version. When you read what the policy documents, on the basis of which they did what they did, when you read his personal vision, then you will see that he was like, he was in a class of his own, he and his contemporaries. They were very sure where they were going. And I'm saying to you that as far back as the 60s, those 60s, they already had a vision to create a, what they call a megapolis, an industrial megapolis, in the corridor running from Port Harcourt through Aba to Okiwe to Enugu. The plan was already there in 1963. The plan was already there. In 1963, the plan was already there. These things don't happen by accident. So I don't know. Political consciousness is important. But if you ask me, that personal critical consciousness is even more important. Because that is what is going to influence the level of consciousness you have in politics. And what you do or do not do in politics. 
Well, I, uh, somebody was talking about the high cost of living in the southeast. Bros, you know, when I go to, sometimes when I go to this, uh, some of our restaurants that I eat, I don't know how you're measuring this uh, cost of living thing. I don't know how you're looking at it. But I think that the southeast is actually, you know, um, in terms of, if you want to compare, say, with Lagos, with Abuja, I don't think the southeast is, the, is much higher than those uh, places. Really? House rent and school fees. Okay. That's, then I, I am, I am, okay. Well, you, um, excuse me, you also know that cost of living cannot be legislated. I hope you know that. That if I build a house for the, as an investment for the purposes of renting it out to make money, right? Depending on where I build the house, how I build the house, how I finish it, right? I decide who I'm going to rent it to. I hope we agree on that. That a house in GRA, a house in independence layout, will not cost the same as a house in Garki, as a house in Achar layout. I hope we agree on that. So when you've made your choice, I think that you should also be mindful of these things. That would be my uh, general uh, comment on that. What's this one now? Just take one last one. Any last to invest in Ebola. Yeah, so a very important one, right? Somebody was talking about how to get Ebola to invest here. Well, you know, I believe that I believe that uh, Ebola's face an existential challenge in uh, Nigeria today. Ebola's face an existential challenge in Nigeria today. And whilst it may be easy to say that investments they have in Lagos and Abuja and Kano, those investments are anchored on the size of the markets in those regions. Money will always go where it will produce the best results. However, if you're faced with an existential threat, then your first challenge is how to even survive. How do you, even, how do you make sure you even have your life, that you continue to live, and so I just hope, I just hope that in order to avoid this, the, 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 the kind of uh, situation that it was suffered during the Civil War, that these existential challenges of today will encourage our business uh, leadership to actually begin to look back home. To look back home. Those will be my comments, really. But Igbos do really have an existential threat on their hands in Nigeria today. And it is only wise and smart for them to actually begin to look back home. When the time comes, people who need to import from Ibo land will import from Ibo land. If it becomes, when, it, when, when we get to that bridge, we'll cross it. And so we cannot continue to be at the mercy of people in their own localities and then have our businesses destroyed, have our, our lives destroyed from time to time or just whenever they feel like it. So I do agree with you that we need to do something about that very urgently. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Before we thank our amiable hosts and the wonderful organizers of uh, the Inkata Umwebe series, I just want to, uh, on your behalf, thank our wonderful speaker this evening, Mr. Frank Mweke, Jr. Please join me in giving him a round of applause. I think if you were in any doubt before you came here about the importance of leadership, I think that doubt would have expired sometime during the past two hours. I think we all now understand that leadership is serious business. Leadership cannot happen by accident. And where there is a failure of leadership, we get what we now have. It's quite symptomatic of the fact that we have not had the kind of leadership that we all desire, that we all yearn for, the kind of leadership that we all should be proud of, that we have to go back 56 years ago to find an Igbo leader that all of us can stand up and be proud of. It's quite remarkable that we came here to paint the image of a current Igbo leader, and we looked around, all of us, and we couldn't find that type of leader that all of us could say, yes, we'll stand behind and shout his praises and say, that will be worthy followers of such a leader. 
If you don't remember much from today's lecture, I want to give you the following sentence from Frank Mweke's lecture. The predicament of Ndibo in today's Nigeria flows from the internal conflict in the Igbo cultural, political, and economic socialization. So actually, the failure of leadership in Igbo land is due to all of us. We have all not demanded the kind of leader that would have been proud to follow. And to finally round this up, I want to again bring that notable son of Igbo land into the conversation. Somebody who has spoken so clearly, so eloquently, and so forcefully about the importance of leadership, both in Nigeria and especially in his homeland, Igbo land. Chinua Lumogo Achebe said that Nigerians are what they are because their leaders are not what they should be. I want you to remove the word Nigeria and put Igbo wherever I said Nigeria. Igbo land is in the state it is because Igbo leaders have not turned out to be who we expected them to be. Thank you very much for being here today. Please, another round of applause for both our distinguished speaker and the moderator. I, I know that many of us still have questions and comments we would have liked to make here, but the whole idea of Onkato Muibe is for us to have this conversation and continue this conversation until we have the next one. So wherever you are, where you're having your tea or beer, where your friends, on your dining table, in the kitchen with your kids, please, please let's continue this discussion on leadership. We are only prisoners of our own time. We can't stay here much longer than we should. So on that note, I want to invite Chief Ben Etiaba for the formal vote of thanks, then we'll be done with this. Thank you very much. Distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, may I, on behalf of the Center for Memories, give the vote of thanks. And first, I will... I will have to say thank you, a big thank you to the guest lecturer, our brother, the good friend, Mr. Frank Mweke Jr. Can we please put our hands together for Frank? <laughs> Having listened uh, to Frank this evening, it's no longer a surprise to me that 20 years ago, he was part of the team that uh, ushered in this present democratic dispensation. And having gone 20 years, <laughs> Frank is still brand new. New chassis, as we say in the Navy, raring to go. So expect more from him in the coming years. Frank, we're grateful. Thank you. I am delighted also on behalf of the center to thank a great anchor this evening, Mr. Jerome Okolo. I first uh, got to know about him when uh, he did uh, a TEDx uh, session that I watched and later met him a few months ago here at the club. So Jerome, I feel honored also to be in your presence. No, no. Nkata Omibe um, holds here 5 p.m. every first Friday of the month. So please don't wait to be invited to be here. The venue is the same, and the time is the same, and the day of the month is always the same. And having held this session, I want to thank the executive chairman of Enugu Sports Club, who is the chief host here this evening, Honorable Onye Konwe, who unfortunately is not here. The vice chairman is also not here because uh, they are honoring an invitation from the governor, who is our president, His Excellency, uh, the Right Honorable Ifani Uguanyi. Now, I am in Soka. Indeed, I was also meant to be there, but we can't all leave this platform. So, but please, Frank, uh, the chairman has asked that I express his apologies. But he was also ably represented by the media secretary, Sir Emmet Mbelu, who gave the welcome address. Also here is the Social Secretary who spoke earlier, Comrade Tony Ude. 
Having done that, I want to appreciate in a very special way my brother, uh, a former presidential candidate, and indeed when Frank was dealing with one of the questions, he referred to the new breed of presidential candidates, and uh, I'm sure that Professor Kingsley Morello didn't fit into, and I'm sure he didn't want to categorize him into the new upstarts who didn't know much about the economy or who didn't have much vision uh, for Nigeria. Kingsley Moralo had a great vision for Nigeria, still has a great vision for Nigeria, and I know that his day will come. So, Professor Moralo, you're most welcome. Always delighted to have uh, the former governor of Imo State, Governor James Aneke, here with us, Your Excellency. I'm happy to see you here. Thank you for being with us. From the golf section of Enugu Sports Club, Chief Ike Mokoye. Ike, I'm sure you're here because uh, it's uh, Frank Roike. Most <laughs> welcome. And uh, the father of one of the trustees of the centre, uh, the father of uh, Dr. Ndidi Muneli, uh, 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 Professor Paul Okongwo is here. Professor, welcome. One of the promoters of this event uh, from day one uh, has been uh, Engineer Chike Madweke, uh, Urban Radio, uh, the owner of Urban Radio. So, Chike, you're most welcome.